epidermis dermis, as I was saying, we, we, if we ablate it, we have um, remnants of sort of epidermis left within it, but in the neck we don't. Because this would run on much lower densities, I'm running this on density 5 at the moment. And the interesting thing is, when you're density 4 or 5 in terms of uh, laser elect active FX, you're almost up to the stage of not having fractionalization at all. So when we're doing next, I knock this back to density 2. I probably also would knock the power back to maybe about 18. Now, the size of the pattern doesn't matter that much. The shape of the pattern doesn't matter that much. The power of this sort of machine is going to be, at the end of the day, in the energy, the wattage, and in the density. And um, we're very successfully now through the, the backs of hands, we've done abdomens, we've done necks, and um, I'll just show you sort of, you know, on a neck, but I'll set the delay sort of um, probably up to one millisecond. The patient, when we're um, doing the patient, we, we do regional nerve blocks. We know that the superorbital nerve comes up here, if we feel along here, we feel the little foramen at the superorbital notch and one mil of lignocaine um, with um, adrenaline. I tend to use, in Ireland we can get this, I think in the United States you can as well, it's xylocaine with adrenaline. And um, normally one mil here will cause paresthesia of the whole central to almost the area above the eyebrow, right up to the scalp. The supertrochlear nerve comes in here, can put it a little lateral, and we know that the zygmatico-temporal branch you know, of the um, trigeminal nerve and facial nerve, um, given the sort of um, paresthesia of the face, the facial nerves involved are mostly motor function. The trigeminal nerve has a branch that sort of, you know, runs through here as well. We know the, the, the split that covers this lateral aspect. We can get most of the lower aspect of the face through the infraorbital nerve comes down here and buccally we can um, get into the nerve at the frenulum that just goes at the level of the third tooth. On the bottom the mental nerve can be got at the frenulum that runs at the aspect of the fifth tooth. So if we do a block on the patient um, periorally both the mental and the infraorbital um, nerve can give us paresthesia almost of this total area here. Superorbital will give us this area here. So technically then we have only sort of the lateral aspect of the malar and the sort of um, pre-auricular area where the sort of parotid is uh, to cover. And um, this gives very, very satisfactory blocks. And it saves the need for general anesthesia. It makes it much comfortable for the patient. They don't have any sort of wakening up things to do. I'll just do the neck for you. Now, when I'm doing the neck, I'm going to be turning on the vacuum. And it's probably going to make a noise in the background. I'll also get all of my eye protection shields again. This is Lorraine, our laser nurse. She'll be assisting the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 that's pretty good. But I mean, I'm sorry, excuse me. You may find, because you've only got top of your anesthetic on here, it could be a little sore. Okay. So you can immediately even know by the sound of the laser turning on that power. And there's a lot of little tricks we can use. And um, if I want to decrease the power of the laser itself, obviously the closer I go in, the more power it has. The further I go away, the less power it has. The further I move off the skin of the patient, other things begin to happen. It's more difficult for me to maintain an accurate um, computer pattern and also there's obviously going to be a little more smell because the vacuum is created when the bottom of the sort of protector is on the skin then that's the exact right focus for the laser and the exact right one for the vacuum exhaust as well. This is a very successful technique. We've done probably as many as 3,000 faces and, and probably uh, certainly four to 500 necks. Initially, when we were doing necks, <clears throat> I must say that I favored um, Tamver, Tamsecrever over Acecrever, mainly because it's easier for the patient to take one tablet a day rather than sort of five tablets a day. 
I must say now that I favor Valtrex as our prophylactic antiviral, and it's amazing. Our sort of herpetic infection rate has dropped probably as low as 2% now, and a lot of centers, even though you are on mandatory Valtrex, you can still have an infection rate of as much as 10%. And I see uh, in some of Tina Alster's papers, that's the sort of level she was getting also. Thankfully now, we almost haven't had a herpetic um, infection in almost certainly four months. And if the patient does get a herpetic infection, don't worry. There's a couple of things, I suppose, that we should worry about. First thing is, obviously, global herpes can spread to the brain so you can get an encephalitis. But the fact that you have a prophylactic um, antiviral on board usually tends to mean that the herpetic infection is well winged and the infection shouldn't last more than about three days. I personally really knock up the medicine and I may get a call from my local pharmacist saying, well, you know, what are you at? If they're in Fanber, I move them from 750 up to three times that amount, three tablets a day. And if they're in Valtrex 500, twice a day, I move them up to three times that dose, so it comes about 1,500 milligrams twice a day as well. And antivirals in general, even though they're very expensive, don't tend to have um, a lot of side effects. And as you know, in most countries, you can almost buy them across the counter, but you've got to respect the fact that... Um, you can see the patient's very, very comfortable, even though I'm running very high settings, you know? And um, one of the reasons, I suppose, is that um, the patient has a little pre-med on board, um, which is fantastic um, for reducing anxiety. In terms of the uh, corneal shields, I find these ones are the best. You know, we can use many, many different types. And um, I am... Um, the common, I suppose, ones that people would tend to use um, would be these types here with sort of um, rubber uh, suckers. These are fantastic. I got these from a Canadian company. I'm sure you can easily get them anywhere in the United States as well. They come in and out very, very easily. There's no trouble in the patient. Thanks for that. Now, when the patient originally has these out, they're going to be blurred a little while, maybe for as much as three or four minutes. And that's very simple to explain. It's the lacquer lube that we use as a lubricant on the cornea, just puts a little film on the front of the cornea and creates a different refractive index, and that's absorbed, you know, sort of fairly quickly. So now, Freddie, how are you? Absolutely fine. Are you? Listen, I noticed just, and we'll see this from time to time, I've left a little dot there, so eye yeah, shields back on for a, no, sorry, eye shields are fine, but just eye protection on for a second for everybody. Thanks. Right, yeah, that's just my hands there. Okay. Sorry, and I'm just going to give it a little shoot here. Um, that's why you're probably better not um, switching your laser off until you have seen the, the face. The other thing is that um, you've got to really get the anesthetic off the face because we know that the CO2 running at sort of the wavelength about 10,000 tends to favor um, water um, in the skin. That's how it works. Now, we know the CO2 is a fantastic laser for many reasons. The first thing is it coagulates the blood vessels. The second thing is depth of penetration down to up to 700 um, nanometers and is very, very controlled. And um, the third thing, the thing I like about it is that with the new type now, you get no peening. The patient can go home. Obviously, we and put on quite a lot of Vaseline, and um, the seal array right here, you know, sort of putting on the Vaseline. Vaseline is wonderful for many reasons. The first thing is we're trying to protect the skin from things coming out of it, like albumin, and we're trying to protect, I suppose, the skin from things going into it, like microbes or chemicals. So we have a general rule here that nobody puts anything on the face of Vaseline for certainly five days. Um, You've got to respect the fact that you're taking off epidermis, so you have dermis on board. So in terms of even the sunscreens, we're a wee bit worried about which ones we use. Microbes, bacteria, and in this part of the world, thankfully, we don't get much fungal. But when I lived in California or in Australia, fungus, we almost had to protect. Terpenidine, we tend to use, lamsil, 
but honestly, I don't even give it as a prophylaxis. I also don't give any antibiotics as a prophylaxis. If somebody's got acne, and we do a lot of acne and acne scarring, I may put them on prophylactic cover because the bugs can spread from one cell to the other. In terms of Botox, Botox and CO2 is I can really go hand in hand together. I tend to give Botox beforehand so that two things happen. It's almost akin to somebody ironing a shirt. If you can flatten out the shirt beforehand, then obviously you're going to get a better effect rather than sort of trying to iron a shirt with wrinkles in it. The second thing is Botox tends to work like plaster paris. And as a consequence of the Botox being on board, the chances of the wrinkles coming back either in the periorbital or periorbital area is vastly diminished. So Botox and this really go hand in hand. When do we do it? Well, if you do it a week beforehand, fine. Sometimes we just do it a few days beforehand, and that's fine. I don't tend to do it afterwards. You could have a problem with sort of giving Botox, particularly in this area here. Because if we look at this little map of the face, you can see that zygomatic is minor and zygomatic is major. Both um, have their origin and insertion. They hold up the lip at this point here. So if you've got a situation where you've got a bladed skin beforehand, then you could potentiate the effect of the Botox. You could run into zygomatic as muscle. And as a consequence, you could have a patient with a, a droopy lip or looking like they have a stroke. And certainly nobody would like that. In terms of the Vaseline itself, it's cheap. It has antiseptic stroke, uh, almost like antibiotic properties. We know that it's been used you know, um, for almost 100 years in terms of overtar and its effects. It's one of the distillates of, sort of, you know, of the oils. It, it also um, is readily accessible. Every Walgreens or Tesco from here to New York will have it uh, sitting on the shelf. Um, it's always a good idea to tell the patient beforehand to, to get some. It might be embarrassing for them having to go to Tesco with the red face. Now in terms of the face itself, I tend to show patients this beforehand. Now the pictures are deliberately made redder so the patients will not get scared. But you know that initially you're going to have after the first hour, these little dots in the face. We can see the dots even on Freddy here as well. But the interesting thing that happens is that after you give the Vaseline for a little while, all these dots tend to coalesce and disappear. And the face will sort of turn red like this. Over the next two or three days, it'll get redder. Day three is usually the day that it is the reddest. Now, the interesting thing is that if the patient on day three starts to say, I'm getting itchy, I'm getting little spots coming out, always think herpes. The, you know, they may have other sort of infections, cytobagylovirus, other sort of um, viruses can get on board, but um, if herpes is going to kick in, it normally kick in day three, and in my experience, it just lasts the seven days. If you have prophylaxis antivirals on board beforehand, you can almost say seven days from the date that it appears, it will disappear and will not cause any problems. Make sure you up the sort of um, medicine because you're moving from prophylaxis into therapy phase and because there's a small risk of herpetic encephalitis then certainly we would respect that and a lot of our patients come from overseas Freddie has come from London to Dublin some of our patients come as far away as Sydney and I must say that we've even patients coming in from the United States now I'm not mentioning that from any sort of um, advertising point of view I mean that your bloody patients have been treated remotely in other words they could be phoning you from Cork or they could be phoning you from London or they could be from Sydney and as a consequence of that you better tell the patient beforehand look if this kicks in the patient knows exactly what it is here is the sort of um, dose that I want you to give to your pharmacist and if they need to contact me regarding this then they certainly can because um, most um, I suppose pharmacists wouldn't be used to um, having antivirals in that building. Freddie's a pharmacist himself have you ever heard of anybody in Fanver three times a day for Seven days. I suppose if you've got that, something like that in the years after a query, and that's, you've got to respect that. Most people aren't um, used to dealing with herpes in a global sense. And that includes most hospitals. I've had one or two patients that have presented to the hospitals, and the hospital didn't recognize what they had. And you can't blame them, because most people see herpes as cold sores, but certainly whenever you get a herpetic infection, post laser procedure, it's just a big red face that goes to the laser's purple. The rims are going to show the patient the acne aftercare um, things now, so we're able to pick up from there. Okay, Freddie, so first of all, we need to just keep um, cold Vaseline on the face and only Vaseline for the next four days. So just okay. keep it in the fridge, is that okay? And just apply about five times a day. Sure. And um, just you can gently wash your, your face, 
tomorrow with just kind of tepid water. Um, and you can have a shower tomorrow, but just make sure that you avoid any hot water near the areas that sure. you've done. Also, you have no protection at all on the skin, so if it's um, the sun is out, you have no, no protection, make sure that you're well covered, okay. that you have glasses on or a uh, shade. And also to avoid topical exfoliation for four weeks, and then after day four or day five, you can go back to your normal skin regime. Okay. Is that okay? And if there's any problems, to give us the ring. Thank you. I suppose one of the things we've got to be careful of, excuse me, particularly in areas where there is a lot of sun, is that we don't want to be taking away people's wrinkles and as a consequence leaving them susceptible to basal cell carcinomas or for that matter squamous cell carcinomas. There isn't a direct correlation, believe it or not, <coughs> with melanoma sort of carcinomas because that tends to be exposure to sun at a much earlier time in life. So we respect the fact that you probably should wear SPF 50 and above. We even give our patients up to 100, um, if such a thing exists, some people say it doesn't, um, for a period of certainly 12 weeks afterwards. And um, that um, is the end of the lecture. Thank you.